Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gentleman Project Podcast. I'm Corey Moore. And I'm Kirk Chegg. Thanks for joining us today. Today, to my right, I've got one of my really good friends that I've known uh, over the last 10 years. I've watched his meteoric rise to fame. And you probably have heard him and maybe seen him perform, act, sing. He is the whole package. His name is Casey Elliott. He has toured as a world performer, including starring as Radames in the US National and International Tours of Aida. Other theatrical credits include Jean Valjean in Les Miserables, uh, Sidney Carden in The Tale of Two Cities, Robert in The Drowsy Chaperone, Zorro in the US premiere of Zorro and the Musical, Joseph in the Joseph and the Magnuson Technicolor Dreamcoat. Film credits, um, he's in some that haven't even been released yet. Uh, Retreat to Paradise, An Hour Behind, Out of Liberty, American Prophet. He is also a third of Gentry. <laughs> yes, you, one third. <laughs> um, they have reached number one on multiple Billboard charts performing cinematic pop that's just this really, really cool genre of music. He's performed with artists like Journey, One Republic, Christian Chenoweth, has over 300 million views online and i've been just blessed to be a part of some of what they've done uh, in my personal life and they've just always shown up for me so um casey elliott's agreed to be on the podcast today fitting us in his busy schedule so thanks for joining us today casey we're excited to talk to you one of the things that's not in your bio is this guy's an amazing father Oh, nice, and nice. He, we're going to let him tell you a little bit about his family. Um, he doesn't look old enough to have as many kids as he does and he, <laughs> he or his wife. We'll get into that just a little bit, but thanks for joining us, Casey. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Um, I have to say, I did see you in Les Mis. Oh, did you? And it was amazing. Thank you. I, I said, well, I've met him a couple of times. <laughs> I know him. I know him. <laughs> exactly. You, it was, blew my mind, actually, how good it was. It was uh, really, really good. Yeah, if you were smart. lucky enough to see Les Mis at Health Center Theater, with all three members of Gentry performing lead roles in yeah. Les Miserables. It was, it was no less than Broadway quality. I agree. Uh, it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was so well, that, good. That story is, is kind of crazy because, you know, that's how we met seven years ago. That's like the show that we were all doing that, that oh, really? brought us together. Yeah. And we never thought we'd do it again, especially with Gentry going and our schedules. We just thought, yeah, it's not going to be practical to ever, if they get it again, if they get the rights, we, you know, it's not going to be practical, but COVID kind of opened the door because it killed all of our performing mm -hmm. uh, for that time. But Hale Center Theater was one of the only theaters in the world that was open, uh, including, you know, any, any productions of Les Mis. So the rights were kind of open. There was this window, the short window for like, a few months. Um, and so they, they got the rights. They were the only theater in the world doing Les Mis at that time. And one of the only theaters open period. That's crazy. Um, and of course we were available. So it was like, Hey, should we do this? Okay. <laughs> what else we got going on? Well, that worked out really well for us. to live around here. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it definitely like they added so many shows because there yeah. was such a demand to come and see you guys. And the cast was amazing. Yeah. The cast really was amazing. And, and the whole crew, I mean, the, the operation that they have over there to produce the, the quality of shows that they do is it's just incredible. Yeah. We bought season tickets this year. Yeah, again, and it's, it's like, worth it. It's totally worth it. My kids love it. And and pricing wise, I mean, you're getting Broadway quality shows, and pricing wise, it's like kind of the fraction of the cost of what it would cost to to yep. get season tickets to you know the tours that come through. So yep. So we're doing a commercial for Hale Center Theater <laughs> yeah. at the beginning of the podcast. This podcast now. is not sponsored by Hale Center Theater, <laughs> but they give enough back to the community. Maybe we should say that they are a sponsor of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. They're not paying for anything, but we're sponsoring it. Um, tell us a little bit about your family, Casey, so people know, because this is a, a parenthood, fatherhood values podcast, yeah. um, a little bit about your background uh, growing up and also like, where are you in your fatherhood journey right now with your kids, their ages and what are they doing? Yeah. Well, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Riverside, California and lived there till I was about eight. And then my family moved to Utah my, my parents are musicians themselves. My dad is a film composer and my mom is a singer songwriter. And, and growing up, they had, um, 
they were like eighties rock stars. I mean, they, they had a band and they would, would gig and tour all the time. And, you know, as a kid, I, I remember just like going and, and either taking a nap under my dad's piano or just kind of like burring myself in their little studio. I would literally try to hide myself in their truck that they packed all the gear in to go on their gigs because I, I wanted to go on the gigs, That's you know, awesome. such exotic places as, you know, Palm Springs and <laughs> those types of places where they would do these gigs and they were like a cover band. Right. So my mom had big hair. My dad kind of had like a mullet and That's great. they would wear, you know, their sequin jackets and stuff. And, um, I just thought they were, they were so cool. That's kind of the environment I grew up in. And, you know, my parents are, are very creative and very, very much of the mindset of like, you can do anything. If you set your mind to it, you work hard, you can do anything. And so I, I think I definitely kind of have taken a lot of those philosophies into my own life and my own parenting style. Right now, my family consists of four kids. Uh, my oldest boy is 16, uh, which is crazy to me that <laughs> he's that old. <laughs> He became a man child overnight. I'm looking at pictures yeah. of him going, Oh my gosh, he's a little Casey. Like, he's like six one already. Oh, wow. Like I'm sure he's gonna be tall. I'm six three. He's gonna be taller than me. Uh and then I've got three girls, fourteen, uh, twelve, and nine. Yeah, life life is uh life is good. It's busy, it's crazy, you know, like navigating puberty and hormones and <laughs> And, uh, our kids, all of our kids are very social, you know, so it's, it's like, imagine that. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> well, it's funny. Cause Joseph, when we, when I went on tour with Aida, he, he was eight months old when we left and I, I took him, my, my wife and, and my, my boy, Joseph, they came with me on tour. Cause I was like, not about to go travel for a year and not have my family with me. And, and so he was, you know, he traveled to basically every state in the first year of his life. And he was surrounded by everybody in the cast, like that he was kind of the tour mascot. That's great. You know, a lot of the cast members like would fight over who gets to watch him and babysit him. So we could like go on dates sometimes. And, uh, so he, he kind of has grown around, um, grown up around a lot of adults and around a lot of different social situations, which I think has really helped him. So he's probably having a very similar experience growing up as you had growing up with your parents being performers, being in the <laughs> arts, right? You guys sing together sometimes on social media. Like if you haven't followed Casey on social media, do it. Like he sings in his garage <laughs> and it sounds better than most people you would hear on the radio that have like lots of post editing and uh, sound sound help. And he just sounds amazing just singing in his garage. So, um, but your son, Joseph, is singing with you now. Yeah. A lot just, of those videos. He's good. Just recently. Yeah. I mean, he, he went through this phase where he loved to sing as a kid. And then he hit puberty and it was like, I'm never singing again. He just totally shut down on the singing front. Just within the last like couple of months, really, he's, he started to open up a little bit, uh, which I love. And the fact that he, he has consented to me posting, you know, him singing with me on, mm. on my social media is like so exciting to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love singing with my kids. It's interesting as I think about my own childhood, you know, and my parents and looking at them performing that I think one of the main differences now is you have this social media thing that didn't exist in the eighties. And, uh, you know, so that's, it's an interesting dynamic. A lot of my kids, friends know who I am because of social media and, and those types of things. And it's like a good thing and a bad thing, you know, cause it's sort of like, I've really tried to, make sure that I don't, I don't force or impose my passions and, you know, my pursuits on my kids. So with music specifically, I, I, I of course I always encourage it and I am excited when they're, when they're, you know, learning piano or learning how to sing, but I've never been like, Hey, you have to do this kind of thing. Cause I want to, I want them to find their own passions like that. You know, thinking about being a dad, that's like one of my biggest points of focus is, is to help my kids find the thing that they're passionate about. Like, it doesn't matter to me what it is. I don't, I couldn't care less if it was singing or, or whatever. It's just like, I, as long as it's ethical, like I want you to just be passionate about it and I want you to just love it, you know? So what are your kids into now? 
Well, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter is super into piano, loves piano. She's just progressing like crazy. Joseph, he loves music. He loves to sing. He is probably our, our most social kid. So he loves to be around friends and people like he's just a social butterfly and he loves, <laughs> fortunately, you know, he's my only son. And so he loves a lot of the same hobbies as, as I do. Interestingly. <laughs> Amazing. Not by chance. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> there was some design. Put yeah. This wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. It was funny growing up. Cause like, I like to golf and I like to mountain bike. And so I got him into those things from an early age. Cause it was sort of like a free pass that I had with, with my wife. It was like, Hey, I'm just, I'm going golfing with Joseph. You know, it's, it's, it's bonding time. It's father and son time. All <laughs> golfing fathers have used that. I use it still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's quality family time. We yeah. have to. Yeah. Yeah. So thankfully he's, uh, he also loves those things. Genuinely. That's funny. That's fun. One of the things that you guys do with Gentry is a lot of your music is tied to values. Yeah. It teaches something. And these guys don't just cover songs. They cover songs and they're amazing covers. They're usually better than the originals, but a lot of their music is originals that they've written based on a value that they think is important. And I have to tell a little story about the very first time I met Casey, he called me to do some stage outfits for them. And he invited me into his office and he pulled up these Pinterest boards of this is the type of look that we want for this new group that we're thinking about forming. And they didn't even have a name for it yet. And he said, we're leaning towards the gentleman trio and we're going to shorten it to Gentry. And we want our music to convey values and uplift people as they listen to it and that they can listen to it with their kids and enjoy this uplifting music. And my mouth just kind of dropped because I had just come from a meeting for the gentleman project. We were just in the very, very early stages. And I had one of my son's leather bound gentleman project journals in my clothing fabric bag. And I pulled it out and I said, can I just tell you guys like what I'm working on? Because this feels like I'm in the right place at the right time, sitting and talking to the right people. And ever since then, I've just completely respected the vision of Gentry to bring about a good, positive message to the world. And you, you feel it, you know, you listen to these songs and we've actually used some of these songs in some videos that we've done. You guys have given us the rights to, right. to use some of your songs and some of the videos because they match what we're trying to teach in the gentleman project so perfectly that, you know, one the song one, one person can make a difference in this world. And it all starts with an idea. Music is amazing teacher, right? Oh, absolutely. You can say it a thousand times, but unless they sing it in their head as they're going to bed at night or when they're working music, just hundred percent is it crosses this level in your brain that it teaches at just a different level. Yeah. Yeah, and there's this this powerful magic that happens when you combine words and music. It does. It reaches a deeper part of our soul. It's it's hard to explain. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you today is, what are some of the experiences that you guys have had uh, blessing lives of other people? I know that you've done a lot of service. Yeah. Um, one of those things was when my gr when my grandmother was passing away, she was home on hospice, mm -hmm. and she loves gentry's music she was your number one fan <laughs> and she had all your cds listen to them every day and gentry showed up at my grandma's house and sang her favorite songs and one that was unreleased mm -hmm. and it was just a magical experience mm. you do stuff like that all the time though this wasn't just a, a, we know Kirk, you guys show up for a lot of different people. Can you tell us a couple of those stories? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think maybe just going back to your, your story of our initial meeting and this whole idea around gentlemen, um, we started Gentry, we knew we wanted to, to sing stuff, but we didn't know what. And the more we started talking about it, the, the more we realized that, you know, performing isn't just about entertainment. 
music and, and acting and whatever it is, is it's a powerful medium that can be used for good. It was also a standard that we could set for ourselves. So it's like, okay, we're getting into this music industry and, and, and stuff. And how do we keep ourselves on track? And the principles and ideals of, of gentlemen are, are something that we wanted to aspire to and, and still want to aspire to. So in a, in a lot of ways, you know, we, we were passionate about men and, and our roles as husbands and as fathers and just as men in society and the importance of, of masculinity and um, these things that one might call traditional sort of values that uh, more and more are getting lost in sort of gender confusion or gender roles. And so we, we wanted to sort of stand for something, I guess, something that we felt deeply about. And, uh, and a big part of that was, okay, how can we write music and arrange music and, and create this brand, if you will, uh, that, that can be used for good and that we can use as a, as a means of influencing those around us for good. One of the greatest blessings of the work that we've done is sort of that one-on-one -on -one interaction that we get to have with fans. I mean, first of all, the fact that some people are are such huge fans and have followed us from the beginning and have this like deep, deep love for us is so humbling, right? It's like, we don't deserve that really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just, we create music and we send it out. And that's the beautiful thing about creations is you, you send it out and it becomes this, uh, its own thing that interacts with people in ways that you never really intended because like, you're not there. You just, you created this thing at one point and then it continues to evolve and grow and, and interact with people in, in unique ways. And so when we get to visit people like your grandmother, um, especially in those one-on-one, -on -one, you know, more intimate, um, situations, it's just so special. Uh, it's, it's hard actually to, uh, to get through singing a lot of times in those situations because it's just so moving and you see how moved they are. And people ask us a lot, like, where have you enjoyed performing the most or what, what has been your, your favorite performance, your favorite venue? And, and I think all of us have answered, you know, it's not the, it's not the big venues. It's not what you would think. It's those one-on-one, -on -one, you know, intimate, personal interactions that we get to have with people. Do you guys have a song that is most impactful to you? Like, is there one or two that you say, or that are impactful to your family, you know, yeah. or, well, I, I think in a lot of ways, the, the very first song that we released was called Dare. The principle is that we should never stop daring to dream and pursuing our dreams and pursuing what might seem to be impossible. And in, a, in so many ways, that was, our, that was our dream. You know, that was our mantra as 30-year-old dude starting a boy <laughs> band, you know. We, <laughs> if that's not dreaming, I don't know what is. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that song continues even to this day to be sort of our mantra and, and it means so much. And, and we were, we were so blessed and lucky that that song kind of got the traction that it did because it was featured on like ABC world news and NBC nightly news and, and all these outlets around the world because of the story that we told. And it also kind of demonstrated from the very beginning that it wasn't just about the music. It was about the storytelling and the principles that we were teaching that was going to resonate. So in so many ways, that set the foundation for the rest of, of, of so much of what came later, which is telling stories that had universal, eternal principles and truths associated with them that, that moved people in personal ways like that. It, it just showed us, okay, that's the way forward. It's not just about, you know, having a good time, even though we love to have a good time and we do in our shows and, and, and all those things. But uh, ultimately the impact that we make is from the emotional connection that people have with our music. So, so where did, I don't know if I know this story, you've probably told it many times, but tell me about why Gentry was born and what inspired that dream at 30 to create Gentry. Yeah, it's funny. It's a funny story. Um, it, uh, it, it came as a, a product of the women in our lives. Uh, and most of the good ideas of Gentry have been a result <laughs> of the women in our lives. So my wife had gone to an event where she saw another uh, music group perform. And this was like maybe a month after that. 
uh, Brad Lever and I were hanging out at my house. He had a date over and, and we were playing, you know, board games at the table and just kind of chit chatting. And, um, my wife looks at us and she's like, oh, you know what? You guys should start a, a male singing group, but have it be like, you know, Broadway and like, you know, uh, you, you can, you're just, you're more mature than the group that she saw was like younger guys in their young twenties. And, She's like, you could be like more manly. And she, she was kind of describing these things. And then I had a friend that was visiting us from LA and she just started going off on the dating scene in LA and how she was so frustrated with the men that she was dating and just kind of the lack of chivalry. And she's a more traditional person. And so she wanted that. She wanted men that were just like, you know, protectors and providers and just, you know, manly men. And, and, uh, and so the more we started talking about this idea, it's like, actually, that, that could be an interesting thing because we're, we're all sort of manly men and we, we like to, you know, look good and, and look our best and do our best and all those things. And so that was kind of the spark, I think, where it was like, okay, you know, being a boy band <laughs> at 30 was like, uh, I don't know if that was going to work. But as soon as we started talking about the principal side of it and what we could sort of stand for, that's when I got excited about it. Um, cause also my kids were at an age where, you know, at that time I was like, what can I, what kind of legacy can I leave my kids? You know, what can I do that I'm proud of, you know, that I can sort of look back and say, I'm proud that I did that. And so, um, anyways, the next day we, I, I called Steven Nelson, who's like the fourth member of Gentry. Yes, he is incredible. He's, like, I've never seen a musician do what he can do. So the story with, with him is I, I just done a gig with him, um, like a concert and I brought him in last minute. Um, another performer that I was performing with knew him and we ended up adding some songs last minute. We didn't have sheet music for. And so I'm like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I can go try to buy the sheet music online. You know, he's like, Oh no, no. What's the song? And he's like, okay. Uh, and he's just doing this like rain man thing in his head for a second. Um, and then he just plays it. It's incredible. And then another song he had never heard, he pulls it up on YouTube, listens to it, kind of gets the idea. It's like, okay, yeah, I think I got it. And then just plays it perfectly. And then, and then That's so, unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, okay, this guy, I got to keep tabs of this guy. Yes. He's amazing. So of course he's the first guy I called after we had this conversation and <laughs> he tells this story better than I do, but what, you know, when I called him and kind of explained the concept, he's just like, Oh my gosh, how do I get rid of this guy? <laughs> <laughs> this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Um, but I convinced him to do one arrangement for us. It's like, just, you know, just, let's just do one arrangement, see how it goes. So we did. And after we got together and kind of sang it, he was like, okay, well, maybe there's something here that's kind of interesting. Uh, so he did another arrangement. And then after that, after the second arrangement, he was like, okay, I get it. And in fact, after we sort of honed in on the, the idea of cinematic pop, which is this idea of, of luscious, uh, lush orchestrations and three part, you know, pop harmony. That's when it really clicked for him because he uh, has always wanted to go down the film composing route. So for him, having the opportunity to work with orchestras and, and arrange and compose for full orchestra was like, you know, what he wanted. So cool. I remember the first time I heard you guys sing, I was standing in your kitchen. Oh, yeah. And you pulled up just the instrumental version of one of the very first songs that Stephen had arranged. Yeah. And I think you guys sang Dare. Yep. Um, and then you sang um, Guide Me to Thee. Yes. And I just looked over at my wife and just went, that's unlike anything I've ever heard live and in person to hear you three sing a cappella in your kitchen. And it sounded so good. I'm like, okay, like, there's something special going on here. And so I have just loved seeing you guys have success. You guys are all three, just, well, all four. I've, I've been able to get to know Steven as well. All four of you are quintessential gentlemen. Oh, You've okay. never, never in any way given me any idea otherwise. And I think people can feel that. And that's why people are attracted to your music and why they want to come and see you. You guys do a Christmas show in the Intermountain West that's probably the most popular Christmas show anywhere. 
it's like people's family tradition to come and see Gentry for Christmas. Yeah. So, um, and I just think that they feel that Christmas spirit around you guys. And it's just incredible. It's, it's hard to understand unless you, unless you've heard Gentry. Well, after the podcast, get off the podcast and go find Gentry's music. Um, it's everywhere. Um, including YouTube, 300 million video views. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, that's got to feel pretty cool to know that you've impacted that many people. Yeah, it's it's insane. In fact, one, one of our videos, um, I think it has like 127 million views now. It's a Christmas video. And it just continues to rack up the views like during the summertime. Oh, that's <laughs> so, fantastic. So it's, I don't know who's listening to Christmas. It's little drummer boy. It's like... Who's listening to Christmas song during July? I mean, I don't know, uh, but uh, but no, it's it's humbling and and uh, we're we're so grateful that it it's resonating with people. That's cool. What are some of the things? If I was to ask you, Casey, what are the three things that you find most valuable values that you find most valuable that were taught to you? What are those, and mm. who taught them to you? Yeah. Well, I mentioned my parents and, and their, their work ethic. I, I think the work ethic of my parents is something that I think I've, I've um, benefited so much from. I mean, they're just, they're not only hard workers, but they're, they're so creative and they're sort of like, uh, you know, the sky's the limit kind of philosophy of like, yeah, you can do anything, you can do it really well. And you just, you just go, go to work. Um, I, I love, I love that. And I still see that in my parents to this day. I, I had actually the opportunity a few years ago to work with my mom in her real estate business for, for about a year and, and just was still blown away. She's, you know, 60 and, and just still just killing it, you know, and, and, and starting new things. She just started a new art business and, you know, so that, that's encouraging to me. Um, I think the other thing that I learned from, from my parents is that, uh, you should love everybody. Thankfully, it's not our place to, to judge people. You know, we will give that to God and, and thankfully, because like, I can't imagine having to do that, <laughs> but, uh, but we our role is to just love people and we all have our, our issues. We all have our things that we're dealing with. Uh, at the end of the day though, uh, you know, love, love is where it's at and, so they, they were the type of people that could associate with anybody, you know, and, and, uh, and have a good time, have good conversation. And so I've, uh, I think I've benefited a lot from that. Just thinking about my, my life and my career, I've, you know, I've, I've been in different industries around lots of different kinds of people. And it's just great. Cause I, I don't feel uncomfortable around anybody. I, you know, I love to associate with any, any, any human being. You know, I think maybe the third thing is, is, uh, just personal to, to my faith. My, my parents are, um, very faithful, religious people and, uh, and they certainly have passed that on to me, you know, and, um, I, I've seen them go through challenges in life and they're unshaken, you know, and that's, of course, you know, now that I'm, I turned 40 this year, like I, I feel like I'm. I have my own belief, you know, my own faith, my own foundation of faith, but I have to give them credit because they, they're the ones that helped me build that foundation from the beginning. Like I wouldn't have it if it wasn't for them. It's awesome. Sounds like your parents have been amazing influences on your life. Absolutely. Yeah. So this last seven years, I'm imagining, you know, during COVID, it maybe slowed down a little bit in a lot of ways, but before that, probably traveling a lot and gone a lot and late night performances. So yeah. talk to us about kind of the balancing of, you know, doing that and having a, a young family at home, like growing young family and, you know, making sure your wife's happy in the whole nine yards. Yeah. Talk to us about, <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, how you did that or what worked, what didn't work, that kind of thing. Totally. Well, first of all, my, my wife is a saint. Yes, uh, she is. <laughs> she <laughs> She is, she's so incredible. Not only it, has she put up with my crazy schedule, but she's always like, she's, she trusts me and she's up for whatever I, you know, sort of feel like needs to happen. And with my career or whatever, it's just cool to have that support is um, such a massive blessing. And 
You know, it is, it is tricky to find that balance uh, with your family and your schedule and your traveling schedule and all that. One of the aspects of that that I, I love the most that I've, I've tried and I'm continuing to do uh, to this day is I, I try to bring one of my kids with me on every trip that I go on. And I sort of got this idea from my, my wife's uh, family. Her dad was in pharmaceutical sales when she was growing up. And, you know, his, his area was sort of Idaho, Wyoming, Arizona, like this corridor. And so he would just, he would drive, but he would take kids with him. And they would just like, they were homeschooled like my kids are. And so they would do their homework and stuff in the hotel. He would go out and work during the day. And then at night he'd come back and they'd swim in the hotel, you know, pool. And it was just kind of a, a good bonding time. And so I, I started doing that a number of years ago and, uh, but just one kid at a time. And I joke with people that it's, it's the time that I realized that I not, not only love my children, but I like them as well <laughs> you know, because I get to know them. You know, when you have multiple kids and you're on a, a, a family, you know, trip or whatever, there's like a dynamic that is just so different than when you're out one-on-one with your kids. And so um, that's, I think, one of the ways that we've, we've found that we can balance things is to just spend that one-on-one time with them. And I've been able to take my kids to some really cool places and, and have really cool experiences. Like I just took my daughter to DC and we saw the, the, you know, historical sites. And then we went up to New York and, um, you know, I, we were able to go to a Broadway show together. And, and so I would say, you know, if there's any other guys out there listening, if, if your travel schedule and, and work environment allows you to do something like that, do it, you know, take that opportunity um, obviously my kids are homeschooled and so it's a little easier during the school years to uh, the school year to do that. But even then, like, even if you had to take time off of school, I'd say, do it, it's worth it, <laughs> you know, uh, cause it's a few days at a time, but it's going to have a massive impact on your relationship with your kids, your, your individual connection and relationship with your kids. I mean, just to have that time together in the hotel room to just chit chat and just one-on-one and you know, on the airplane, I don't know. It's just, it's just one of the the sweetest things about what I do is being able to kind of share that with my family. And I think for those listening, um, this has been a fairly common theme with some of the people we've had on the, on the program, because it's hard to find that time. It's even harder to find that one-on-one time. And I look back at my own childhood and the moments I've had with my kids. And those are the ones we remember the most too those moments where we unplugged from normal day-to-day activities and normal, you know, I get up, I go to school, I, I go to work, whatever. Um, I think that's huge. Yeah. And here's the other thing that I've realized you, you can do something a few times with your kids and they'll remember it. Like you always did it. So it's not like, you know, it's like if you go camping with your family or whatever, you, you go camping a couple of times, they'll look back in their childhood. Cause I do this with my own, my own upbringing. I'm like, oh yeah, we always went camping. But in reality, it's not like you went camping every weekend or whatever it is. Right. It's just one example. So I would say, you know, just, just start doing something small and those little small things will have a massive impact because they, they sink deeply inside of their memory and they'll, they'll remember it like you always did it. You know, you, it was just a tradition you guys always did, even if it wasn't very frequent. Well, I think it, as some people think, I've thought this to myself, like, oh, I should have done some things different with my 16-year-old, who's my oldest also. But there's still years left, you know, like even if you're on the, the back end, they don't even live at home anymore, or they are starting their own family, you can still create some of these memories and some of these one-on-one moments. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about this the other day as I was watching some older videos of my kids. I was thinking, oh, I just, I miss those years. I wish I could go back and just like give them a hug at that age. But the reality is like every phase of life is that. Like we're living in a phase that in 10 years from now, we're going to look back on and think, oh, I wish I could go back. Totally. So, you know, take advantage of, of every day you know, and, and relish every day, because like you said, even if they're adults, you're going to build different types of experiences and connections with them. Like one of the cool things I do with my dad, even to this day and my brothers is we'll go golfing like once a week 
and my dad is always the one coordinating it. You know, he's like, Hey, does this work for everybody? And, and whoever can, you know, we meet up and we, we go do nine holes. And so, you know, that's something that, that uh, my dad is doing to build relationship and connection with us even at this age. Yeah, that's killer. I love that. So you mentioned a couple of times just in passing that your kids are homeschooled. How did you and Zarelda come to that conclusion that that's what was best for your family? She was homeschooled growing up. Okay. Um, and so she kind of had that foundation and, and, uh, and, and support system. Her, her mom is still really involved with helping her kids because pretty much all of her kids do homeschooling in, in one way or another. Uh, a lot of, a lot of us kind of have a combination like, uh, Joseph is half homeschool, half public school, just cause for him being as social as he is, that is what we felt, you know, he needed and wanted. I I've supported her and however I, ha- you know, could, but she is the one that has like owned that. Uh, so all the credit goes to her, uh, cause you know, she's, in fact, we were filling out this form yes, uh, yesterday and, and it was like title you know, for her. And I was like, put household executive or, you know, household co-founder because <laughs> principal. Yeah. <laughs> principal. Like she, she's just not only a full-time mom, but she's a full-time teacher to her kids. And so again, she's, she's awesome. But yeah, she, it's, it's been all her. No, I think that's something we don't talk enough about on the podcast is when you meet someone, at least I wasn't this way. I didn't, really think through, well, what kind of mom are they going to be? And I'm sure there's women who don't quite think through what kind of dad are they going to be, you know? So maybe tell us a little bit about how you met your wife. And then did you guys have those conversations? And at what point did you go, did you just, did it just click for you? Like you were pretty much on the same page or there are conversations of, well, that's not how I saw the world. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's, that is such a good Good question. It's such an important question. Um, so when, when I met Zerelda, Zerelda is her name. So first of all, when I heard her name, I was like, what? <laughs> That's hot. <laughs> but we met, we met at Weber State University and um, I knew immediately I was interested in her because she was not only beautiful, but she was smart. She had like gotten up in front of the class to give this presentation. And I was like, wow, this girl is like, she's sharp. She's beautiful. And it took me about three months really to finally like connect with her and just hang out. But, uh, this is sort of the condensed version of the story, but we, we hung out, it was on a Sunday because she worked on the weekends at doing like weddings and stuff. And so I knew like, okay, she wasn't going to be working Sunday. So I called her up, went up to her house and basically just hung out with her and her entire family, like on day one. (laughs) Uh, but it was that, that connection that night, um, the next day we, we hung out again, pretty much the whole day. And then the next day, the whole day. And it was like really, really fast where we found that connection and, and, you know, eventually we were engaged in like two weeks. Wow. So super fast. But (laughs) I think one of the reasons is both of us knew what we wanted. You know, we had a really clear idea of what we wanted. I knew I wanted to marry somebody, number one, that was going to make me better. It was going to elevate me. I, I knew for me personally, I couldn't marry somebody that I was constantly bringing up. I had to marry somebody better. <laughs> and, and she fit that bill. She was super spiritual, super, you know, focused. Uh, she had great grades, like all these things. Like she was just, I knew she was going to make me better. Uh, and then I knew I wanted to marry somebody who wanted a family, you know, that, that looked at motherhood as the number one priority. And, and she, that was her, like she wanted, she always wanted to be a mom. She, she came from a family. Uh, her parents had seven kids and then they adopted eight kids when she was like a teenager. Whoa. Dang. So <laughs> she, they're going to a different heaven than I'm going to. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's so true. They, they're saints. Uh, in fact, three of the kids they adopted are special needs and still live at home and will live at home the rest of their lives. Like they're, I mean, just that level of sacrifice and commitment is amazing. But you know, she, they adopted all these kids when she was a teenager and she basically became a mom. You know, she was taking care of these kids at the age of 14 until she was, you know, go out of, out of the house, going to college, uh, and, 
And so I looked at that. And I was like, this is somebody who isn't afraid of hard work. You know, she knows what it, it is to be a caretaker and a mother. Um, she has a deep, deep faith, you know, that, that at the time seemed unshakable and has, has proved to be unshakable over the last, you know, 18 years. I think for her, it was a lot of the same thing. She wanted somebody who was going to keep their faith that was going to be, you know, their first priority was going to be a father and a, and a good husband and a provider, a protector. You know, again, like all, all these things that we now call traditional, quote unquote. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, she, she knew what she wanted. I don't know. That's, that's a long-winded way of saying, I guess, that we both knew what we wanted. And when we found that in each other, it was just like, okay, this is it. This is a no-brainer. Uh, and of course we, we went back and forth and like, maybe we should wait until mm -hmm. next year, maybe get through another year of school. She was like, just finishing up. I was just starting. Uh, but we concluded like, look, this dating, this dating thing is going to be a nightmare once we're, cause it was summertime when we started dating and thinking about our school schedules for the next semester. We're like, Oh, this is going to be a nightmare trying to balance all this. So like, we know we want to get married. Let's just do it. And it worked out. That's cool. So you've been married 18 years now? Uh, yeah, 18 years this August. That's great. It looks like it worked out just great. Yeah, <laughs> they're amazing together. Uh, I have actually been really looking forward to asking you this question. <laughs> okay. Ooh. And at the end of every podcast episode, we ask our guest what they think it means to be a gentleman. Oh, yeah. And so would you answer that question for us? Sure. As, as a member of the gentleman trio. <laughs> well, I should preface it. Uh, sometimes I feel a little, a little shy about, you know, our name being the gentleman trio. Cause I, I don't want people to think that we are putting ourselves up as a, a standard or a, you know, like, Hey, we figured it out because it's, it's a work in progress. Um, but, you know, to, to me, what being a gentleman is, and one of the reasons we, we decided to focus on this as a group is it's eternal, um, universal principles of goodness. And for me, being somebody of, of deep faith, I look at Christ as sort of the ultimate gentleman. Um, you know, somebody who, who saw people's potential who loved people unconditionally, who served people without question, you know, that, that to me is kind of my, my ultimate example that I look to and somebody that I try to be more like. And so I think in some ways, the idea of a gentleman and that title is <laughs> a more socially acceptable way to, to say Christ-like, you know, for me, that's how I look at it, define it. We talk sometimes about, okay, well, what is, what is the modern gentleman? You know, how can we, how can be, we, how can we be sort of gentlemen in this day and age that we live in? And, and I think it's, it's just like those core things of, of courtesy and kindness and love and respect and, uh, responsibility, you know, you're not shying away from, uh, standing for what's right. You know, just these, these core principles that we all know and we all sort of accept as universally good and ones that we, we want um, more of in our lives. So it's just sort of a call to, um, to, to have more of that, you know, to have more of that goodness in our lives. Well put. And the world needs more of that. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Um, gosh, we live, we live in a, a really interesting day and age and it's harder and harder to, to decipher what's true and what's not. And to me, what's true is what's real. And, um, the, the principles and ideals of a gentleman to me will never change. Like those are unchangeable. And so those things to me are real more and more. And this is another thing that I, I try to teach my kids a lot is the importance of, you know, you hear a lot out there, uh, my truth, and my reality. And I think when people say my truth, I think what they're saying is my perspective of the truth. But I believe that there is a truth. There is a reality. And rather than trying to mold the world to, to our reality and our truth, I think that one of life, life's pursuits is to try to mold ourselves to the truth 
You know, it shouldn't, it's not the other way around. We have to try to conform and bring ourselves to an understanding of the truth and the reality. And so, um, again, I think that's what being a gentleman means to me is, is trying to better myself and align myself more to those, those universal eternal principles and truths associated with that. Spoken like an actor reading a script. <laughs> he was not reading a script, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> He's just well-spoken. Casey, thank you for being with us today. That was really good content. Uh, hopefully provided a lot of value to the people that listen to the podcast and that they'll share it. And that they'll also look up Gentry if they haven't heard of Gentry yet. Um, I talk about you guys quite a bit as I'm out and about. And I'll say, hey, have you, have you heard of the group Gentry? And... It's either an emphatic yes or no, but it sounds interesting. And they look it up and tell me how much they love the music. So oh, thank you. Well, Kirk, uh, you, you've been, uh, I'll just say this really quick. You've been such a, an important part of our journey, literally from almost day one. You know, you, you mentioned your story about, about meeting us right when we were starting and you were starting the gentleman project. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Oh. You know, I think ideas, they ideas ideas distill on multiple people so that we can come together you know and help each other and and help promote something good and so not only do you make us look great but you've been a great <laughs> friend and a great supporter of you know what we're about and what we're trying to do well i love what you're doing so it's easy for me thanks so. for being with us that was a fantastic podcast thank thanks. you thanks for appreciate it everybody if you uh, have not subscribed to the podcast please do so hop over to apple podcasts or any other platform that has podcasts you can find the gentleman project podcast if you wouldn't mind like and subscribe to the podcast share it with your friends if you found some value in what casey said today or anything that you felt prompted to share with somebody in your life follow those promptings act on each good thought make it a great week and be a gentleman thanks everyone Thank you.